All right. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our second installment of Share Screen Africa's Raptor Education Series. Oh, let me close that down. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces in the audience tonight. Uh, I see all this, uh, the, some of the, the students from TUT. Welcome to you guys. Welcome to everyone. Um, my, uh, for those that, of you that have not met me yet, my name is Kaylin Padiachi. I am from an organization called KNAV Conservation Foundation, and I am absolutely stoked to be your host tonight on um, this amazing Raptor Education Series. For those of you that have joined us last week on Unlocking Nature um, to listen to Dr. Gareth Tate on what makes a raptor a raptor, um, we're going to be doing things a little bit different tonight, all right? So we're going to start off with our headline speaker, who's going to tell us all about people and birds, and specifically people and raptors, uh, and then we're going to go over to um, a pre-recorded video from what we'd like to call our inspirational speakers, and they're going to tell us all about how cool it is to work with these amazing birds uh, on a daily basis. After that, uh, that pre-recorded video, we're going to move over to and open the floor to questions from the audience. So um, I hope you brought all your birding, uh, birding questions, uh, your raptor questions, because we have a very, very knowledgeable, um, not only a raptophile uh, tonight, but also a birder uh, in, 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 uh, in general, um, that's going to give you all the answers that you've ever thought of regarding uh, raptors and birds in general. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce you to our headline speaker for tonight, Aldo Baruti, with a profound um, passion for birding that dates back to 1965, Aldo's childhood interest has blossomed into a remarkable career as a research ornithologist. He holds a PhD in seabird biology, achieved through his dedicated work at the renowned institutes such as Fitz, uh, the Fitzpatrick, uh, Fitzpatrick Institute, um, the Sea Fisheries uh, Research Institute, and the Durban Natural Science Museum. He played a pivotal role in the early years of BirdLife South Africa as the first director, initiating groundbreaking programs such as Abbey Tourism, the Bird Fair, the Buckerstrom Center, and many, many more. Fueled by his unwavering dedication to sharing his knowledge uh, for the love of birds, Aldo, together with Emil Funden uh, Hietkamp, founded the transformative online birding courses of Birding with Aldo. Throughout his career, Aldo has consistently championed the noble cause of introducing people to the awe-inspiring world of birds. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to the one and only Aldo Baruti. Over to you, Aldo. So welcome, everybody. My title, Me, You, Birds and Raptors for Us. And I'm really punting here the human element of this interaction. Now, <clears throat> thank you for that introduction, Kaylin. Um, I would like now just to say to you, there are two big questions that in this presentation. The first one I want to pose to you to be answered in the course of time and perhaps, and, and, and that may be decades, but it is really, how do you fit yourself into the world of birding and raptors in particular? What does it bring to you? And I hope in the talk that I give you, I may change some of these perspectives that you just might have come across. I've also got a much narrower question for you and here it is. In Birding with Elder, I have a Facebook page and every day I have a bird of the day. And here it is. So what happens with my bird of the day? I put up a bird and ask people to have a go at identifying it. And then the next day, the answer is revealed, by which time most people have got it anyway. But yeah, pop into the chat room, guys. A widely distributed raptor of Africa. And pop into the chat room your answers. And we'll have a look at the end, the answer to that question. And right, so on we go. Now, a little bit more about myself, and Kaylin has, has helped to short circuit this. Thank you. I live 
uh, in the Southern Drakensberg, which uh, is on the Western border of KwaZulu-Natal up against the mountain. So Lesotho is right around the corner. In fact, the picture taken on the bottom left, I'm actually standing in Lesotho with South Africa behind me. So I've, I'm an old dog, been at this for a while. Uh, it began with all the, the typical passion of young children uh, getting involved in things, bird watching and ringing. And then, then came the scientific stuff. I trained as a research ornithologist, was the Cape Gannet flying over my head there that gave me a PhD eventually and a picture of myself with a white chin petrel down on Marion Island a good many years ago as a young man. And then there was this critical change, became first director of BirdLife South Africa and did to the world of conservation with BirdLife International. That was a wonderful time. And I, one of the things I did start and, and which is, is hey, I'm really proud of was began the community guide training program, BirdLife South Africa, and it is still going. So I'm chuffed about that element of it. So I've gone in different ways. I've been a commercial birding guide the last few years until COVID. And now I'm doing online birding courses. So the bottom line is I've always enjoyed and loved, put aside the admin, put aside the science. I've always loved showing people birds. Right. So why is it? Why is it that birds really grab us? And I say to you, what are we doing right now? What senses are we using? I'm talking to you. We've got all these bright images for you to look at. Sight and sound are our primary senses. And this, it is the same with birds. So it makes birds very, very tangible for us. Almost much more understandable in a sense than many other animal groups and biota and so on. Um, let me play you a couple of sounds. This, the call, the sound of Africa. The fish eagle. And for those of you spread through Africa in the bush felt, in the savannas. The woodland kingfisher, as you see on the top right. It, as I play that sound, it takes me into a nice, warm, Bushveld, Savannah Place, can smell the potato bush rather than this chilly place I'm in at the moment. Sight and sound are so important for us. And birds too, very active, color, not a lot of animal groups have got color vision, but birds share color vision with us. And they share this unbelievable capacity for flight and long journeys as this visual shows. Now I'm going to show you a trip by an Af uh, a, one of the raptors which comes to, to Africa and it follows, I'll show you the path, but it comes right across from the Amo region which separates China and Russia right up against the Pacific. So there is the bird, there is the male bird and there's the first step of the journey and then it comes across the Indian Ocean, a three-day non-stop flight across an open ocean. I mean, that's it's stunning stuff. It really is. And the overall journey, 14,000 kilometers. This is the longest migration flight of any raptor. All right. Now, birds, birds, national birds. And as the years have gone by, become more and more people orientated with things and I, uh, here I am on the left mentoring a bunch of people but birds represent many things so on the right hand side there's Kenya's national bird lilac breasted roller all our nations have a have a national bird and for example the white dove of peace there are so many symbols relating to birds they are used and anybody recognize what is represented here these four women here are the super falcons, the, the Nigerian woman football team. And along with the South African women's football team into the next round of the World Cup. And so it is, 
so it is that birds are used as symbols of strength, of, of, uh, of power, and, and yet of softer things as well. They appeal to us so much. Now, going back then, birds and birding. Listen, guys, it's, it's good for us. And there's been serious research into what birding and being outside does for, does for us and, and our minds. We live in a tough world, a stressful world. And if you go out birding or involved with birds, it actually in, in really improves your outlook on life in the short term. And I'm absolutely certain in the longer term. And of course, the physical activity that goes with it. And particularly for us gray warriors, it's critical to get out there and keep the body moving. Birds and birding are good for our minds and bodies. So it is a benefit that comes from joining other people when you are out there. Right, and raptors. They hold significance in so many cultures. And at one point, the Royal Society for Protection of Birds did some research and they found one of the critical things which turned people on to becoming interested in birds was an encounter with a magnificent or charismatic bird. And boy, do birds like tawny eagles that, that you see on the top right there, do they fit that bill? We have birds like the spotted eagle owl on the bottom left there. These, these are birds of, of myth and legend in a, in a great many cultures. And going back, as you can see on the screen, to the Egyptian sun god Horus, after a raptor again, it is no mistake that so many of the symbols relating to birds are raptors. Right, so coming back to you and this world of birds and birding, is it a lifelong passion or is it going to be a professional career? Well, typically, you know, the bird is focused on ticking off new birds and make no error. If a thing doesn't have a name, it doesn't exist. It is important to be able to identify birds accurately or whatever it is. If you do not have an app, the correct name for something, you cannot access past information on it, for example. And basically a thing without a name does not exist. But that's only part of the story. I think for so many birders, the life list kind of overrides anything. And I've learned as I move into six decades of, of birding is, hey, there's so much more. In recent years, photography for us has, has played a role. And, and it's almost been like rediscovering those birds all again. In our own yard, we feed birds on a daily basis. We're looking out the window to see what is visiting us now. It is consuming after six decades. But it can also be a career, right? There are different paths. You can go into conservation as, as a manager, but we also need those research scientists who are going to produce the information required for effective conservation of, of Africa. There's another path to guiding, commercial bird guiding. It is a, an important economic activity in my district it is important with people coming into the Sani Pass and in many places. There, I'm just highlighting. These are some of the different ways that you can go with your birding. Think about what it is, professional or just a passion, that you, you can go with this and fit it to yourself, fit it to your personality like a glove. And... You know, learning at a raptor center, here we see uh, uh, people coming face to face with a Vero's eagle owl, leopard face vulture, a Rupal's vulture. This is that interaction with that huge, magnificent bird. I remember 
early days of BirdLife South Africa doing a, um, a public day in a mall somewhere. And we actually had um, <clears throat> a, from a raptor rehab center, we had an African hawk eagle with its handler with us. And I remember this one woman walking along um, and I remember she, she wasn't paying attention and she suddenly caught it, her eye on this African hawk eagle and she literally froze. And for about, she didn't move for I think close to five minutes. She was so utterly entranced by what that bird represented to her. Places like these rehab centers are very powerful for connecting with people. Now, I'm going to give you now three bird stories based on raptors because to me, if you want to get people to remember things, if you want to engage, you need to tell a story. So I have three different stories for you. And one is a local story for us. So in the area where we live, the jackal buzzard is a common bird. And for once, it's a colorful raptor. It's got a short little tail, <clears throat> usually red and uh, uh, broad wings. Now this picture on the bottom left, I've already mentioned my bird of the day. This, this picture, which was taken by my wife, is the one which has had the most engagement over, so we've, we've probably posted of, about 1,200 pictures over the three years. And this is the one which grabbed people's attention the most. Now listen to the call. And for those of you who know the Blackback Jackal, listen to this. And this is where the name comes from. So many raptor calls tend to be really quite high-pitched and uh, fairly similar. This is a really distinctive one. And we've enjoyed the challenge of working through all the immature and juvenile colorings. There's raptors that can take for the large eagles and vultures several years to get to full plumage with an array of confusion in between. And that's a brilliant challenge. Right, so I've got some, some videos to show you here. The first one on the, on, on the left, this bird does not move much in the beginning, but this is just to give you a feel for how these birds are. It's actually sitting on one leg and just, just watch as it will eventually drop its leg. See how they move their heads, sort of focusing on you. What's going on there? What's happening? This is a really nice red jackal buzzard. And wait for it. Look at my indicator, watch for the leg going to come out of the plumage here. There it comes. Oh, it's starting to get nervous. Whoop. And off it goes. And here on the right hand side, a shorter clip, but it shows you that distinct shortish tail, the chunky build of a buzzard with its broad wings as it goes. And there it goes, the bare legs of a buzzard, off it goes. Thanks, guys. Now, so that was a story about things that we connect with. And this is now a wonderful story about, uh, well, wonderful. It's, it's a worrisome in many ways about a magnificent bird that is threatened, right? It is, this is the bearded vulture. It's a stunning bird in so many ways. So how about this? It is capable of digesting bone. Right? So bone marrow, which is within the bone, of course, is very rich, but they can digest bone. It's a food. It's almost unthinkable for us as human beings to think of bone as a food. These birds do it. Typically, you see them like that bird in the top middle there, a long pointy tail, wedge-shaped tail in the distance. They're, they're huge birds. They look like gigantic falcons and you see the beard here on the right hand side the beard of the bearded vulture because they feed 
on drier carcasses and the like. They do not have bare heads. They've got feathers and, and you know, they're pretty damn good looking birds, are they, are they not? Now, in, <clears throat> they are in Southern Africa, we have an isolated population which is critically endangered. There, are, there is a second subspecies which ranges from Spain through to Nepal. It is in East Africa, most birds in Ethiopia there. But the South African, Southern African population, it's mainly in Lesotho, it's perhaps down to 200 birds. And there is a vulture recovery program on the go. It's actually situated just 10 or 15 kilometers from where I live and uh, uh, in Underberg. And the goal is to release maybe 10 birds a year in to supplement that existing population of less than 200 birds. Its champion is Sharon Hoffman down there on the right hand side, who is one of these uh, dedicated people who give over their lives against all odds to try to make something happen. Because this is an isolated population, the birds which are released back need to come from the same genetic pool. So there's a very successful vulture, bearded vulture breeding program in Europe. They've released well over 200 birds, but the genetics are, are different. So we need the local program. And this bird on the left hand side is about four years. It takes them seven years to turn into these stunning individuals that you see on the right hand side. These birds like this as top predators as represent the health of ecosystems as well. If an ecosystem is not healthy, you don't have your top predators. And here is another wonderful story, a completely different sort of raptor, the brown snake eagle. Again, we just think about the insights it gives. But firstly, look at that bird on the bottom right with that kind of vaguely astonished look of those big staring eyes and the big head. Now, I assume that the really big head is because they've got really big eyes because they have to find snakes. Now, you know how seldom one actually sees a snake really. And yet a pair of birds like this in a territory covering tens of hectares are eating one or two snakes a day. Where do they find them? How do they catch them? Are they, who knew? Of course, we know the experts know how many snakes there are out there, but it's an indication of the kind of insights of the complexities of these world that we have. And let's move on to this next. I'm going to show you a video now of the brown snake eagle dancing around the Mozambique spitting cobra. You will hear the people talking underneath it all. Watch the bird in the beginning grabbing this cobra by the tail. It gives you an idea of what the what they take on. He's gonna grab his tail. He's grabbing his tail. <laughs> Chick, 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 chick. The video. <laughs> Do you think it went? Would I have found getting expanded? Mm-hmm. No, no. <laughs> love it. Absolutely love it. Right. And here we go. I mean... I talk about these raptors as, as inspirational icons. And look at this picture of the, the Bataloo on the right-hand side, which has been bathing and is now drying off. So Bataloos actually are, in a sense, they're a kind of a vulture because they eat small dead things as, as first choice. They're very vulnerable to poisoning, but a brilliantly colored bird altogether. And hey, what a cracking photo. And to the left in the Kachalachaidi National Park, two pale chanting goshawks. There's a much more widespread raptor in, uh, called the dark chanting goshawk further north into east and across 
um, Africa, adult and juvenile sparring uh, with each other. No doubt the adult perhaps, I shouldn't say no doubt, um, but pushing away a, a, a competitor, maybe from another pair, anyway. And then throughout Africa in your backyards, the yellow-billed kite, it's July now. So they winter in Central and East Africa, and they're returning now to South Africa, the very first ones. I hear the reports coming in from the, the coast of KZN, and they breed here. Uh, a widespread urban raptor and another widespread birds of the grasslands, the, uh, the black-winged kite which hangs sometimes like this little white dot over the grasslands as it searches for, for mice and gerbils. Now come back to it, folks. There, there are many, many potential rewards for you out of the world of birds birding from a passionate lifelong involvement, an amateur but rewarding return right through to a career. Just ask you to open your mind to the possibility of what can come back to you and, and go for it. And there we go. Thank you, Kaylin. I've, uh, I've done. <clears throat> fantastic, fantastic. Aldo, thank you so much uh, for that stunning talk. Um, I like how you, you incorporate people and birds in general right so many conservation stories um from so many specialists that 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 i've i've had uh, the opportunity to work with started off with that passion you know as a as a, as a, a person going out and doing birding it just kind of snowballed from there um and and individuals become these amazing scientists and amazing conservationists from just uh that that one moment you know getting to see um a vulture at a carcass or, or a battler uh, soaring above their vehicle. So thank you very much for, uh, for, for highlighting that for us. Birds of prey are a particular group of animals that are actually, as a group, becoming more threatened than any other group. Raptor conservation is a huge subject basically because it departs from the conservation of megafauna. Not going to be able to keep birds of prey behind a fence. So one would do a tiger or a tapir or white rhino. These have to live amongst humans, and that means in farmlands, even in cities, and wherever we are. And I work at the Raptor Center as a Raptor technician stroke host, and I really love this job. And this is my friend Phil. He is a Vero's eagle owl, hand raised by human because he fell off the nest when he was two days old and uh, he broke his right wing. And we now feel things, we are his parents. And he's happy and he likes human company. My passion about birds of prey started when I was younger. My dad used to work as a ranger and uh, he used to take me on game, game drives and they used to see beautiful animals. That's how my passion grew slowly by slowly and after schooling I went and joined KWS. I did guiding by then I came but then I came to love conservation work because I came to realize that uh, owls were much like more endangered because of the superstition that most locals here have towards them. I remember when I was younger, one of my friends, we found a baby, spotted eagle out, and he opened a wing, wanted to tell us to keep off, but my friend took a stick and killed it immediately. And I got very hungry because I was telling him, don't kill it, just leave it alone. But he went on and killed it. They cannot harm anyone. They're, they're specially designed to work at night, 
Owls are not like bad omen as people say. I really love them. My name is Leah. I'm a raptor technician in the Basha Raptor Center. So Philly is one of my favorite owl I can say. Like it plays a vital role here in our center, like education bird and also to promote raptor conservation here in Kenya. Like you used to say, like uh, most of the people, they don't like owls due to the superstition, like they say, owls is a bad omen in the society, of which is not true. Owls plays a huge role in the ecosystem. Like, control the rodents populations. So let's protect our So I grew up in Sisabu Conservancy since when I was a little baby. So I used to participate in bird watching and some other activities in the park. So I spend most of the time there watching the birds. So I didn't knew that one day I could work in a raptor conservation here in Kenya. So we have given a name, Horis. So Horis has a problem with the left wing, both left and right, which we call the remiges, the flight wing. It cannot be able to fly and also it consume poison in Masai Mara. We can't release horrors. We also have a rupel. One of my favorites is Hamed, which is a half blind. So working with the raptor, is a, it has made me to become a person who, like a role model to the people, especially to the Kenyan ladies. Though I can say it hasn't been so easy journey for me, because sometimes you get bullied as a lady while you're doing such kind of a work. But I'm telling them, stop, I know what I'm doing. There's a, a group of eagles we call in Africa the mega eagles. And obviously that means they're the larger, more powerful eagles. And among them are the Varro's eagle, martial eagle, and crowned eagle. We have a few others, uh, but they are in small areas, and small pockets. Now when we go back to the three classics, the Varro's, crowned eagle, and martial eagle, one can imagine that they, because of their size, would compete with exactly the same prey resources and perhaps even the same nest sites but they built completely differently the crowned eagle is built like an occipiter with very short wings and long tail and that is clearly designed to live within thick forest and open woodlands These have to live amongst humans. If we don't, then we will not be able to have them with inside our protected areas, which are much too small in order to maintain populations of animals who are characterized by the fact that they are widely dispersed and they have large territories, much larger, for example, than, say, lions. An area occupied by a martial eagle, for example, is enough territory to keep 36 lions. So we have to have our conservation needs to be guided by research. So we have lots of research and we go out there and we try to identify if the species is struggling, what the reason is, before we obviously can do anything about looking after them. And that's an area where it's actually quite safe. It's a nice place to be. One can be well employed, doing something productive, doing the research. You may find that the research isn't really that necessary, but we don't really have the ability to put conservation actions into place because they want the research to be so thorough. 
In other countries, however, the effects of DDT and pesticides that got rid of the peregrine in North America and across Europe, that's one of the classic huge success stories conducted by a lot of organizations where they have done things such as captive breeding of peregrine falcons, producing in many thousands of falcons and then letting them go into the wild by a process called hacking. We today have in North America populations of peregrines that really owe their existence only to that very hands-on hard work. We can do exactly that for other species, and they did that for the Mauritius kestrel. We've got populations, for example, here in Kenya of a bearded vulture, for example, or a lamagar that's in desperate need of being reintroduced. It may well be extinct, and at most we've got three pairs in the entire country. So I love doing my work and I promise myself maybe I'm going to do it for the rest of my life, uh, protecting these innocent birds of prey. So I would love to tell people to come and visit and learn more about raptors at our center. Yeah, caribou is that. I think that video shows uh, I think Leah and Jonathan in, in particular, and Simon, of course, showed just how rewarding working with uh, these powerful birds can be. So well done uh, to Leah, Jonathan, and Simon. Well done, guys. You are inspirational. Um, I believe there was a little bit of issues with, uh, with the sound quality on that video. Um, when we head back, uh, well, in fact, when this... When this video is uploaded to YouTube, um, I believe the, the team will actually have that sorted out. So um, do apologize for that. But please, please, please take a look at that video again uh, when it is uploaded to um, Share Screen's YouTube video, uh, YouTube channel, excuse me. Now, um, I think this is a perfect time to start opening up the floor to uh, to the audience for any questions you may have for any of our speakers. I believe Leah and Jonathan and Simon are, are in the audience tonight. So if you have any questions for them, um, please feel free to ask. Um, but also Aldo, Aldo is still around. So please, please, please uh, feel free to ask your questions. You can either raise your hand by um, clicking on the reactions button uh, at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen um, and just click uh, raise your hand. Or you can even type in your question uh, in the chat, uh, the chat box if you, uh, if you prefer. Um, before we get into that, uh, Aldo, you had a quiz for the audience uh, earlier on in the chat. You want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, you're, you're still muted there, Aldo. There you go. Perfect. Um, thanks, Caleb. Yeah, I did check out the chat room, and most folks clocked in there with long crested eagle. Hundreds, guys. Perfect answer. <laughs> Perfect, long crested eagle. Um, I think let me uh, let me actually. I think we got our first question. Hold on, I just got one. Uh, okay, I, we've got a question from. I think it's Husseini Adamu. I, I apologize if I got that name incorrect. Um, the question is, 
is there any certificate for of participation uh, and how can we improve our conservation of birds in our country uh, i'm assuming these are for the courses provided by yourself elder um yeah if he's asking about my courses um I, I would be very happy to do a certificate of, of participation to show that happening. But um, look, my courses are, are Southern Africa centered um, and essentially they are geared at uplifting birding knowledge and processes, um, uh, not to formally meet any requirements for, for any further training facility. All right, perfect. And the second part of that question was, um, how can we improve our conservation of birds in our country? I think birds in general. Um, and that would be in their country, which is Nigeria. Any any suggestions from your side? I Look, I'm aware that there is a, um, uh, there's a Nigerian partner for the BirdLife International Partnership um and it is very it is an active partner i i did my back then in a, uh, a couple of visits but i'm out of date uh with my knowledge i'll be quite honest and perhaps there's somebody else who can kick in with with a uh, more up-to-date intervention in terms of nigeria all right perfect uh i did see another question come in uh, but it has disappeared now. Uh, okay, a, a, a question from uh, Lizma van Zale. Do birds of prey prey on each other? And and the, the short answer is yes, some of the big ones can catch and eat some of the smaller ones. Um, and, and that's it. I'm trying to remember... Once a pair of giant eagle owls, Vera's eagle owls, um, um, and, and reading through the prey list, which in, I think included common buzzards at, at, at that site. And I do know um, it is, though, a fairly unusual circumstance. Um, I'm not sure. I, I cannot immediately put my finger on any... any um, any species which relies as a major source of prey on another bird species, another bird of prey. So, it, so it's incidental. And of course, inevitably, it's a big guy eating a small guy. All right, all right. Um, I see we've got our first live question uh, from Brian Otiego. Um, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, thank you so much for giving the opportunity. Today you did so good, pretty good. Uh, I wanted to ask Robert to know if there are tricks, if more than one, on identifying these raptors, because I find myself kind of struggling to identify, especially in flight, to know this one is hawk, eagle, and so the list is long. So is there a trick or somebody else has to be doing the budding and, and getting used to getting to get the identification in, in practice? Is there any practical uh, trick behind it? Okay, if I can respond to that. Actually, the identification of raptors is, is so it, particularly with that transition from uh, juvenile through to adult, which can take so long, it is difficult. It, it, it's some of the most difficult birds to identify despite their large size. One of the, um, of course you need a good reference book. What I would suggest is this, is that focus less on colors and plumages than on characteristics like are the legs feathered, 
as in the true eagles, or are they bare? How long are the legs? How long is the tail? What is the shape of the tail? So the, the shape of wings, the, the, the flight silhouette of raptors is incredibly important. Um, I would suggest to you the one of the best ways to begin is with the raptors around you. And it's very, very easy to go, okay, ooh, yellow bill kite, I know what that is. Um, but having, having had a good look at a yellow billed kite, pay careful attention to the wing profile. So for example, yellow billed kites have got long, narrow wings and a fork tail, which it can fan and look almost straight. And become very familiar with shapes, with bill sizes and shapes, and even things like the shape of the nostril. All of things, those things you will find really helpful. Begin with what you know and build outwards. If you have more than one reference source, that's that's great. Uh, but generally, it's hard yards, Brian. No, um, uh, it, it's whilst there are some easy raptors like jackal buzzard and things like uh, adult crowned eagles and martial eagles uh, and fish eagle. Most of them are not easy. A lot of them are not easy, rather. Perfect. Yeah, Thank I, you. I, I think also um, just getting out there, hey, keeping your eyes to the sky and constantly practicing those identif uh, identification skills, um, you'll get better and better as you go along. Um, thanks for those tips, uh, Alda. Um, I see... Husseini Adamu, I see you've actually raised your hand. Um, I hope I've pronounced your, your name correctly. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Of course. Um, good evening, sir. Um, of, of course, you have, you have pronounced my name very well. Um, as I said earlier, I am Husseini Adamu by name from... graduated from... Byron University Kano uh, in the Department of Forest City and Wildlife Management. Uh, actually, I was really, really excited for joining this, uh, this event. Um, we took a course during our studies. Uh, uh, I think the course was ornithology. We have so many interesting things doing, especially uh, we used to attend so many bed viewing clubs from the from Kano State Nigeria. So actually, uh, it was very sweet. It, it was so amazing. Alhamdulillah. So uh, another question that I have is that: Is there any opportunity that someone will uh, opportunity maybe to travel to Kenya to, to further his studies, especially in ornithology? This is my question. Thank you, sir. Um, Kaylin, I'm, I'm not really in a position to answer that. You're probably better positioned. <laughs> um, I think, I think uh, Usaini, let's, uh, let's connect offline. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there, and we can actually discuss it uh, a little bit more in detail. So if you, uh, I think Marit will, will get your details, and we can, uh, we can discuss that a little bit further. But thanks for your, thanks for your, your question. Um, I think let's move on to Kanti, uh, is it Kanti Manoj? Uh, I hope I've pronounced your, your name correctly. Please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Yeah, hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Kanti Manoj. So last time I was in uh, Kenya, uh, somewhere close to the Mara Triangle, and we are uh, working on animal mapping uh, with uh, biosphere expeditions. And we uh, kind of encountered uh, so many birds of prey, like auger, buzzard, uh, beetle art. Uh, and one of the uh, most uh, confusing part was to identify the whether the bird of prey is a low-billed kite or an uh, eagle, tawny eagle. So uh, my question is, is a low-billed kite a scavenger or it, it preys 
it hit it hunts and preys on something or it is an uh, scavenger that's my question because we always look referred to the books but we really couldn't find whether it's a tawny eagle or yellow bill kite uh, yeah so that that's the question okay so yellow bill kites are supreme uh, opportunists so if if uh, an opportunity to catch live prey comes along they will do it they will also scavenge off roads uh, and I do believe that uh, particularly where, um, well, uh, you will often see them scavenging on roads, and I'm certain that a number of pairs of these birds are very reliant on roadkill, uh, depending on, on their situation. Um, so just picking up two, if, if I heard you correctly, so two differences uh, or differences between tawny eagles and uh, yellow billed kites, yellow billed kites with strongly yellow bills, a tawny eagle with a big black bill, right? Yellow billed kite with a deeply forked tail, uh, tawny eagle with a rounded uh, tail. Tawny eagle much bigger, much heavier. It's probably uh, up to three times the body weight of a yellow billed kite and with a much bigger bill. Long slender wings, tawny eagles with broad, broad wings as, as some of the uh, differences. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And uh, Arlo, is a uh, tawny eagle a scavenger or it usually it uh, hunts, right? No, they, they are very much hunters yeah. and, uh, and they are capable of, uh, so they, they will hunt a range of, of, of prey and relatively large um, animals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Aldo. Thanks for your yeah. Thanks for that question, uh, Kanthi. Um, so we've got a couple, quite a few um, chat questions. The first one coming from Asima Ali. The birds of prey um, that pr uh, that prey on one another. Is it because of survival, competition, or just to kill one another? Okay, so I think in the way that um, what I was thinking of in terms of the, those killings uh, is that uh, I was talking about where a one raptor will kill another as food. Uh, we'll often see, uh, and as quite a regular thing, clashes between different species. And in general, um, those, those are not lethal. Um, the vast majority of them, uh, you've got one bird of prey trying to chase away a potential predator away from, uh, from their territory, maybe from, from their nest site in, in, in particular. So birds, uh, animals generally, you know, they kind of don't kill, if you like, just out of malice to kill something else. There, there is a reason. It's, it's because they are food. And perhaps on occasion, it is, it is a fight um, over uh, within a species. It, it can be a fight over territories, uh, et cetera. I think those are relatively rare situations. Though. I see uh, Leah has a, her hand up. Um, it'll be lovely to chat to you, Leah, after that wonderful uh, video. Please unmute yourself and, and, and let's chat. Hi, everyone. Hope you're Hi, doing Leah. fantastic. So it's my first time, you know, being in a Zoom meeting and I'm happy to join you guys. And my question goes to uh, Simon Thompson. I remember you told me about if he's going to join us, yes, that is. Uh, it told me like African fish eagle is not considered to be a true eagle. This is because they don't have feathers going down on their tassels. So I just want to know more details about fish eagle because I've been asked medication about fish ego, which I don't know if it's true ego or not. Thanks. Aldo, would you like to weigh in on that? Um, yeah. So, you know, the raptors are a really, really interesting family. So there's a family of birds called the Asiptridae. Now, most families of birds 
you know immediately what you're looking at. A kingfisher is a kingfisher. You know a starling. Uh, you know a hornbill, etc. Etc. Uh, et Within the the family of raptors called the Cyptridae, there are great many. There's a great diversity. So the fish eagles don't belong to uh, what is tend to tend to be called the true eagles, which are feathered all the way down the legs. And so, um, uh, I'm, and I'm trying to recall what the closest um, taxonomically to the fish eagles are, uh, and I'm coming up with zero. So sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> um, um, yeah. Uh, Leah, I don't know if, if that has helped you, but you know, the bare legs, you're quite right, is something that separates the fish eagle from the true eagles. You also see the fish eagle's got a surprisingly flat head uh, compared to, to many of those true eagles as well. Yeah. And I know from uh, from personal experience, we've had a, a number of uh, occasions where there were fish eagles. We've We've had fish eagles or we've observe fish eagles um, scavenging on a variety of different, uh, whether it's fish that were, die, were dead on the, the shore uh, and even dead horses. Uh, we've seen them uh, um, scavenging on those carcasses. So there are definitely uh, key differences between those eagles and, and, and uh, true eagles, I guess. Let's, uh, let's look at some of the other chat questions that we've had. Um, one from Steve. Stephen, uh, how long do most vultures live? Um, okay, I I can't answer this with authority, but it's it's well into it's well into the decades. Uh, so they are long, long lived birds, um, and uh, in there lies the problem. As soon as, uh, along with long lifespans, they have very slow reproductive rates. So as soon as you increase mortality just a little bit, it, it makes a big difference. So yeah, um, I'm sorry, that's about as accurate as I can get. All right, thanks, Aldo. Um, I... Helen, just to interrupt, Leia or Jonathan could answer that very nicely, I think. Perfect. Leia or Jonathan, if you're, if you're willing to... Uh... Tell us how long do vultures live? Yeah. So for the life expectancy for the vultures, about uh, 55 to 60 years, yeah? yeah. So did you say more than 55 years? Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I see we've got a hand up from Marty. How are you doing, Marty? What is your question? How's it, guys? Thanks, Aldo, for your chat and uh, for this evening's talk. Um, sorry, I haven't got my camera on because it's uh, pitch dark here. So even when I turned it on, you can't see me. <laughs> um, just a, just a, a quick one. Um, a, a couple of years back, um, people, some of the guides started talking about a short-tailed eagle as opposed to a batelure. And I was just wondering, is is there any accuracy in that? Um, I know the, the whole naming thing is quite a controversial topic and birds change names uh, according to the geography they're at and then they try to um, get sort of general consensus. But um, was there ever a time where a battalier wasn't called a battalier at uh, this long, this is, sorry, the short-tailed eagle discussion? Don't know if you've come across it. I, um, Marty, I've, I've never heard the battler called a uh, short-tailed eagle. Obviously, it has a really short tail, and it has that you know unique rocking acrobat uh, flight, acrobat balancing on a on a wire flight. But I have never heard the name short-tailed eagle before, and maybe this is just a local colloquial name uh, which emerged somewhere sometime. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, I see we've got a hand up from uh, Kimi Ray. Is it Kimi Ray Joseph? Hello, everyone. Hi. My name is Kimi Ray. 
I'm a student at Wildlife Research and Training Institute. I'm from Kenya. So I have a question, which is the most endangered bird of prey? <laughs> Tough one, Aldo. <laughs> um, uh, well, what can I say? It's a very good question. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just, uh, uh, look, the perspective I have is, is going to be Africa, and I will be quite honest that my focus is Southern Africa. Um, I know Taito Falcon is going to be up there with, with one of the rarest and perhaps bearded vulture may well be in African terms, um, uh, possibly our most threatened. Um, in, and uh, I'm afraid I would have to, further to that, I would have to do, do a spot of research to see exactly, uh, to get you an accurate uh, definitive, credible answer. I'm being quite honest. Yeah, a bit of a difficult, uh, a difficult answer there. I mean, each each uh, species mm -hmm. has its own unique threat. Um, so to say, you know, which is the most. I think as a group, raptors are generally on the decline in 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 Africa. So as a group, I would say, um, you know. They, they are a threatened um, group of species in general. Yeah. Um, Brian, I see your hand is up again. Is that an old hand or? Kalen, <laughs> Kalen yes. sorry to interrupt you. So Shiv Kapila is in and he's the owner of the Raptor Center. Ah. So um, if he would like to come in, he would be better at answering that, um, that question. By all means. Yeah, I've asked him to unmute, so. Perfect. Uh, hi, um, sorry, I've had internet troubles. What was the question? Um, the question was, what, what is the most um, endangered raptor or, or threatened raptor uh, in Africa at the moment? Huh. Um, <laughs> probably uh, bearded vultures. They're not doing so well. Uh, all the vultures actually are on a steep decline. But you're lo also looking at very range restricted raptors, things like Sokothke scop cells, and you know very very restricted range species that are in good quality habitat now. But with the way that development is going with in Africa, threatened just because of that. Thanks, Shiv. Um... Perfect. Brian, was that, uh, is that an old hand that you've got raised there? Or do you have another question for us? Mm -hmm. uh, it might be an old hand. Yeah. Sorry, I'm here. Yeah, yeah this is a new hand. Yeah. It's a new hand, not an old one. Oh, perfect. So, Ask your question. Now, uh, I have a question with the uh, with the, when it comes to vultures, we have the palm nut vulture, which uh, some way it's argued that's not a true vulture and uh, some way it's a, a vulture, but then now there's some, 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 some work underway that is trying to separate whether or to distinguish it from the other group of vultures. Uh, in addition to that, uh, when it comes to research, we have, for instance, the bearded vulture. When you look at the IUCN red list status or the conservation set of red, uh, bearded vulture, it is not, like I would say, critically endangered. But then in the context of Kenya, I would say that it's, it's a very rare uh, vulture to encounter, very rare. So then it comes to research, then you one would want to, or maybe answer the question of what is the conservation status of the bird to be studied or to conduct the research on. But then maybe the donor, for instance, need a, maybe a critically endangered or so. But then 
when you, I want to work on dead vulture, find that it's not falling in that category, then what's the approach for such? Thank you. Um, Aldo, is, is, I don't know if that's a question for you. I, um, I, okay. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, Brian's trying to uh, establish which raptor species might be good vehicles for getting uh, as research projects and finding funding. Is, is that in essence what he's asking? I, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Um, sorry, I, uh, I'm just asking for, for another opinion. Sometimes with these old years, I don't hear quite so easily. And, and I think, uh, Brian, what you have to do uh, in, in situations like this is, is just have a look and see, uh, based on uh, the organizations that you may already have dealing with and in, in the way that they do research and how they source funding, I think probably your best route here is to ask skilled and experienced researchers within the country in which you live. Um, if you have a particular idea, like the palm nut vulture, uh, bounce the idea off those uh, skilled and experienced uh, ears and, and see, if, see if you get uh, uh, feedback. Uh, um, I don't know, Holly, this might be a good one for you. I see Holly rushing to the camera. <laughs> I am, uh, but I was so busy communicating with people who are wanting questions to me on the phone that I also missed the question. So ask <laughs> me again and I will give you an answer. Um, <laughs> apologies. <laughs> Okay, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase and I, I hope I get it correctly, but I think Brian thought that maybe palm nut vulture would be a, a good subject for research, but in essence, he's also asking, um, uh, how do you work out, I suppose, which species are, are good for finding uh, research for? And uh, yeah, so-, so I guess so from my point of view as an educator, I would always advise that research is done for the good of conservation. We don't, for example, want to know how long a raptor's tongue is, although, of course, there are those people who want to know that. But are we actually helping conservation? Because with raptors, we're at a critical juncture. And this is why we have set up this series. Guys, I cannot highlight to you enough how fast we are losing these species. Now, this whole set of talks is not about the depressing side. This set of talks is about the magnificence of these birds and why we want you to go out there to share those posters, to go and conserve them. So the palm nut vulture is a critical bird for research. Why? Because it nests and it moves along riverine habitats. It likes fruit. And a lot of those doom palms or different palms have fruits. A lot of the fig trees grow along riverine. What is the habitat we are losing quickest? Riverine vegetation. So if you are gonna combine research with making a difference on this continent of Africa, which please is what we all have to do, then palm nut vultures are fantastic to study, but as are all of our raptors. But remember going into research, and this is again why we have set up these talks and why Aldo has done such a fantastic talk. If you cannot translate that science into a story for the general public, we are not gonna get you on board conserving our rectors. So I want you to go home and tell your families what you've learned, look up into the skies and think about research in your own way. You don't have to be a scientist to do research. Aldo has showed us you could be a naturalist drawing things. Look how many bird books have drawings. Look at the artists selling pictures. Look at the people going on bird courses. Look at the mental health um, positives that it brings us. You can use birds in so many ways. So research is critical, but like Simon said in the field trip, Sometimes research is too slow. We need to act right now. So any species works. So I hope that answered it, even though I was a bit hard of hearing in the beginning. 
Yeah, I think I think that's a great answer, actually, Holly. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we got to be careful of of doing sometimes doing research for the sake of research. At the end of the day, um, we're here for the conservation of species, right? So so we need to focus really hard and and ask, you know, questions on what needs uh, the most attention now, and that's where we focus our research on. Um, and in fact, staying with research, uh, we got a question from Jared Loden. Uh, what type of research is done on raptors here in South Africa uh, and is research done exclusively in the field? I'm assuming exclusively in the field as in wild raptors and not captive raptors. Um, yeah. So, Aldo, would you like to weigh in on that? Okay. And I'm going to, again, be really quite honest. I am not current in the field of raptor research in, in South Africa. So I don't know um, how much activity there really is on, on raptors. So um, sorry, I can't give you an authoritative answer. Not a problem. I think, let me, let me weigh in on that. Um, there is a fair amount of work being done on raptors. Um, everything from environmental contamination to um, urbanization uh, and how they respond to urban um, uh, ecosystems as opposed to natural ecosystems. Um, there's a few, few um, organizations in particular that does a lot of research on raptors. Uh, BirdLife South Africa, they have an entire program dedicated to, to, to birds of prey. Um, EWT, Endangered Wildlife Trust, equally uh, an entire program, Birds of Prey program, dedicated to different research programs uh, on, on, on Birds of Prey. And then, of course, you go to our universities, uh, the Fitzpatrick Institute. Um, there are a number of species-specific pro uh, projects uh, between the pygmy falcons out in the Kalahari, uh, black sparrow hawks in urban Cape Town. Um, so, so there are a number of um, of projects running at the moment. Uh, the majority of them are, yes, in the field, if I understand that question uh, correctly, it's it's mainly um, your, your wild raptors. Oh, ESCOM gave me back my lights. <laughs> um, yes, it is um, mainly wild raptors, not so much captive, uh, captive animals. I hope, Jared, that um, answers your question. If you would like more information on that, um, do jump onto um, the Fitzpatrick's website. They have a number of projects that you can read up on. Um, UKZN on the Crown Eagles also have a lot of uh, information on it. And then BirdLife South Africa and EWT as well will be able to shed a lot of light uh, regarding current research on birds of prey in South Africa. Um, I see Josephine has her hand up. Uh, we are running a little over time, but uh, I think Josephine, would you like to unmute and ask a question? Um, thank you. I hope you guys can hear me. Um, the question goes back to ID. I would like some tips to identifying the difference between a gabar goshawk and an ovambo sparrowhawk. I always struggle between those two. It's very difficult to tell the difference. So yeah, I'd appreciate some tips. So, so I've got a short end thing which will help you to sort out all of the occipitus. And what I say to you is take five. What you do is look at the seer color, the eye color, the leg color, tail and rump color, and then finally underparts. Because of course the problem with those occipitus is that the juveniles are so different that it's almost like having a different, well, it is. It's like identifying a different species. They are that different. Um, offhand, a Vember Sparrowhawk is, is quite a largish bird compared to the Gabar. Gabar has got a, uh, a big white rump. I, I think a Vembo, I'm, I'm not sure if it has a gray rump or, or, or a much less. Um, and I think you're going to find differences with, with the seer. Um, they are both dark eyed, as I recall. Um, so the Avembo is a bigger bird. Yeah. All right. Thanks for those tips, Alda. Uh, we've got a question from Mike Almira. Um, and 
yeah, I, I hope Aldo, you're the you're a good person to 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 answer this. Um, he wants to know: Does hand rearing raptors affect their chances of surviving when released back into the wild after rehabilitation? Uh, you know, I would I would immediately bounce that back to to the raptor rehab guys, but I do know um, uh, just anecdotally from from what I've heard. It is a serious problem to rehabilitate um, raptors uh, in the wild. If you have to right from the beginning, if, if birds are actually raised, um, they have to be raised with a, a lot of care so they are not imprinted on human beings for starting. And then uh, it has to go through processes of acclimatizing them to being able to kill uh, or find food out, out there in the wild. Those are just general comments rather than based on my own personal knowledge base. All right, all right. Um, I think definitely we, we're going to be having a talk from Simon Tomset, which is definitely a lot better versed when it comes to uh, rehabilitation and release of these, uh, of these animals. So, uh, and that's going to be on the 30th of August. So please, Join in there. Um, I think he's going to be probably better suited to answer those types of rehab questions for sure. Um, Marty. Marty asks, what, what about Powell's fishing owl also being quite threatened? I think that refers back to the most threatened raptor species in Africa. Am I right, Marty? Marty. <laughs> I think you, so, I think you, yeah, now, uh, now I can unmute. Thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, I just sort of put up there, I think their, their habitat is so um, specific being only found along large uh, rivers and, you know, exclusive fish on diet, uh, fish on diet, diet of, of fish. Um, I, I think that, that I, I would have thought they must be one of the, um, also the most endangered and rare um, raptor species that we have. Uh, I would have to agree with that, and it, it highlights what Holly was saying about um, uh, the, the problems of riverine habitats being um, nailed. So tall, riparian um, woodland is, is, is prime agricultural country too. So loss of that means loss of, um, of pearls, fishing owls, along with pollution of rivers. So yeah, they've got to be they're really high on on the on the food chains, and they've got to be severely under under threat. As, and as I just principle. want yes? to come in there and punt next week's talk because next week's talk is pearls fishing owl, osprey, and fish eagles as feeding on fish. Um, and Kaylin, I just see there's a question about uh, what are the most dangers to raptors, and and I'll ask Shiv to come in here, Shiv, if you would about also raising birds in captivity, because I think we missed the unmute button previously, if you're still there, Shiv. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so uh, threats to raptors in Africa, right? Uh, one of the major ones we found is electrocution. Um, most medium to large sized birds actually uh, favor vantage points in their hunting territories to uh, conserve energy and use to as hunting spots so electrocution is a major thing but also about pet pels fishing owls um yeah i can speak about kenya really where there's been very very few records in the last 10 to 15 years so definitely one of the most threatened and has some of the most specialized habitats as well Thanks, Shiv. I think also you probably you probably while while we have you, um, do you have a a, a response uh, regarding the survival of of raptors um, that are hand reared after rehabilitation? Uh, yeah. Sorry, I um I kind of forgot about that part of the question, but yeah, um, the earlier you raise a bird of prey, the harder it is to return to the wild, and uh, up till a certain age it's impossible you you get an irreversible imprint um flying imprint falcons and eagles in the west is uh 
Well, it, it can be done, but those are birds that are designed and habituated and conditioned to be in captivity for the rest of their lives. Uh, from a rehab standpoint, um, parent reared birds are obviously the best. Um, if you can't do that, say, for example, you get a chick out of a nest that's fallen out, out during a storm, you have to employ various different tactics, like, for example, feeding it through the puppet and then introducing it into a, a, a wild pair's nest. And obviously, um, in a while, Simon will be able to talk a heck of a lot more about that. But the early stages of development of a bird of prey is crucial on socialization on adults who will then also then teach it how to hunt and survive in the wild. Uh, humans cannot sub be a, are not an adequate substitute for that development stage. So uh, in fact, um, Jonathan and Leah in the video earlier on were um, holding on their glove, uh, a Vera's Eagle Owl called Phil. He's our imprint Eagle Owl. He fell out of his nest uh, at the age of about three weeks old and broke his carpal joint on the way down. And because his bones and feathers were still developing, I had to strap and restrap his wing every two days. Human contact was unavoidable, but the way we salve our consciences about keeping him in captivity for the rest of his life is that over the next 25 to 30 years, he would be able to affect the minds of thousands of children uh, for the benefit of owl conservation, which is an infinitely greater in impact rather than having been able to release one owl back into the wild. So on isolated examples, imprints are not so bad, but to give a very short answer to a very long, long answer is yes, we it, it does greatly impact their survival in the wild. So a, a correctly socialized bird has a great chance, poorly one does not. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, I think important points there, Shiv. Thank you very much. Um, I've got another question from Walter. Um, he mentions being at the Alsamir Bird of Prey Center in Naivasha, where uh, he saw a Varroa's eagle owl. And he happened to feed it for several days. The question is, what's the relationship of the eye, uh, the eye membrane being more reddish and having more eyelashes? Um, maybe I can feel this one as well, because I know this owl personally. Oh, um, so it, on a Vera's eagle owl, the only part of the bird that is not feathered are its eyelids. So that's given it has a very simple vocabulary um the eyelids are the only other way to convey emotion so when they flush red they are excited or nervous or scared when they they turn a dull gray they're very relaxed and comfortable okay okay that's uh that's quite informative actually thank you very much <laughs> um i i'm just going over the, the questions that i've had i'm making sure i haven't missed any uh Oh, there's a question from Asima. And this is a, this is a relatively diff difficult one. How do you deal with all those threats to the vultures? Example, power lines uh, that might injure their wings, lead poisoning, or death by other types of poison. I think that's quite a quite a difficult one. Um, Aldo, do you have any any suggestions there? Um, I. Um... You know what I think the best answer to this is uh, th there are many problems, each of which requires a solution. Uh, I think you do have Andre Boerta coming up as in, in your series, and uh, he may be the person to talk directly to the various threats on, on, on the vultures and, and what is uh, what the current ones are. Um, the, the current most important ones are, I think, many threats uh, and, and many solutions. Yeah, in fact, uh, Andre is going to be speaking on the 1st of November, uh, and he is definitely the go-to person for vultures in, uh, in Africa, in fact. Um, so 
again, if you guys, it'll be great to, to, to bring your questions about threats, specifically threats to vultures, um, to Andre on the 1st of November. Um, I believe that is all our questions here. Are there, if there are any other questions, please uh, raise your hand. Otherwise, we're going to close off for the night. Um, and say Hello. thank you very much. Yes. Oh, Marty, there's your hand. I'll, I'll just okay. ask a quick follow-on to the um, the other one about the captive uh, birds and human imprinted birds. Can they still be used effectively for breeding themselves in 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 the cages and uh, getting eggs, etc.? And then ca can those eggs be put into wild bird nests at all, or would would that wild bird not accept an egg in their nest and then sort of another thought um if if the human imprinted birds did rear youngs uh, young in in the in the in captivity would they be able to um correctly teach the the youngsters um about how to be an eagle or whatever um up to a certain age uh, would, would they would that be a, a viable proposition I guess Shiv would need to be answering that too. Yeah, I don't want to. <laughs> I've been asked to unmute. Um, it, it's successful to a certain extent, but obviously it can't replicate exactly what happens in the wild. But over thousands of years, the practice of falconry has come close to mastering these things. Uh, like Simon, I'm sure we'll discuss more about this but he's used falconry techniques like double clutching to um, raise the status of madagascar fish eagles for example and it's a great way to um, double uh, well double the productive productivity of wild varus eagles but as so far as putting an egg back into a nest um, that's very tricky because you that egg will need to be incubated and the wild birds will have to be there within minutes to incubate it. But putting chicks back into a nest does work, um, especially with species that lay two eggs and the elder chick always kills it, young one. You can swap the two chicks and double the product product productivity that way. Cool, thanks, Shiv. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Shiv. I'm so glad that uh, you decided to join the talk tonight. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to call it a night right there. Aldo, thank you so much for uh, sharing your knowledge and your passion for, for raptors and birds in general. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, please, I'd like to remind you all, I'm just trying to find the next date, the next... Uh, yeah, our next talk is going to be next week, Wednesday, 9th of August, same time, 7 o'clock. And this, as uh, Holly mentioned earlier, is going to be the fish eating raptors of Africa, uh, talking about fish eagles, osprey, and fishing owls, which are going to be very exciting. So please, please, please join in next week, Wednesday, same place, same time. Uh, and until then, thank you very much.